Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. We live in a country where men and women are meant to be equal. Same pay, same careers, same opportunities. But children as young as seven think that boys and girls are fundamentally different. I think boys are cleverer than girls. Men are better at, like, being in charge. I would describe a girl as being pretty. And that these differences will define the lives they live as adults. If the woman has a child, the men have to go to work and earn some money. Men are more successful because they could have more harder jobs. I don't believe that biology alone can explain these differences. I think the answer lies in the society we live in. I'm Dr Javed Abdelmanen. What if they called you all sweet pea? <laughs> I'm going to find out if by turning a class of seven-year-old primary school children... What are we doing? ..gender neutral... You've got to start going to the same toilet. <laughs> I can change the way they think about themselves. Everyone can have a chance to do what they like. And the way they think about their future. I do not like reading, but I like reading that book. And if I can do that, perhaps there's a chance of making their adult lives really equal. Made to be underpaid. Would you dress your daughter in that? It kind of makes something that seems so innocent not really that innocent after all. But it isn't going to be easy. <laughs> I want it to go back to boys and girls. They didn't think I could do it at first. What we're trying to do could actually be very difficult. I think you're going to struggle. Every child deserves the same opportunities in life. But unless we stop treating our boys and girls differently, that simply isn't going to happen. This is Lane's End Primary School on the Isle of Wight. Can you please line up ready for assembly? A local school with a good academic record. Yeah. Run by head teacher Caroline Sice. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Sice. 300 boys and girls ranging in age from 5 to 11. All the people, all these people. Graham Andre teaches one of the two year three classes. Right. How could you describe the gladiator? Sir Andre. Hi, sir. How are you? Hello. Sorry to interrupt. How are you 23 doing? seven-year-old children who were born between 2008 and 9. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> the same time that the UK was drafting the Equality Act, the most comprehensive legislation anywhere in the world against sex discrimination. Would you like to share what you've written? These children have lived their entire lives in a world that says it wants men and women to be treated the same. Get things written down. But is that how things really are? Come on, Amber, give it a go, love. Maisie, what we're doing, love, as you just come in, we're sending with gladiators, so we're describing what we're seeing. It's definitely uh, used love for the girls and the boys. Yes, love. It seems to me that if we treat boys and girls differently, that's how they will see themselves. Nancy. Finger spaces, of course, my love. We always need finger spaces. But if we treat them the same, maybe we can transform their views and alter what the future might hold for them. So what do the children in Graham's class think about how different or similar they are? Men are better because they're stronger and they got more jobs. I think I would describe a girl as pretty lipstick, Dresses, love hearts. And boys can only do football. Why is it only boys can play football? Because they're fitter and stronger. I think strong is a boy bear because they can fight lots of people. Right, tell me, who's more important, girls or boys? Molly like boys because they can protect girls more. I think men are more successful because they could have more harder jobs and they would earn more. I think men are better at, 
like being in charge. I think boys are cleverer than girls because they don't, they get into precedent easily, don't they? Louis! What's up, mate? I think from the moment they're born, they are aware of gender. Those children are becoming that mindset that this is what they are. The boys will play football, the, the girls will do drawing and art. They will tell me what jobs they can or can't do. So it's very much that they've still got very set views on what is acceptable for their gender. Shh. Right, Riley, we need to be quiet. Everyone. It's common sense that there are basic biological differences between the sexes. But do these differences explain the way that children think? To find out, I've come to see Professor Gina Rippon, one of the country's leading experts in neuroimaging, to see if there's something about how the children's brains work that could explain it. What are the differences between boys' and girls' brains anatomically? Uh, $64,000 question. Structurally, there appears to be very, very few differences which is quite a surprise to a lot of people who have assumed for hundreds of years that males and females are different because their brains are different. So you couldn't look at a brain scan and say, oh, that's a brain scan of a male or a brain scan of a female. That really doesn't explain why boys and girls might behave differently then. If you say the structure of the brains are, uh, th there's no differentiation between the structure. Well, the other thing that we now know about is that the brain is very, very plastic, moldable, changeable, that something isn't necessarily fixed and invariant, which is what was all thought about the brain. What we now know is that brain development is very much entangled with society, experiences, um, upbringing, and the differences we're seeing are not because they were determined at the moment of conception. It's because this hungry brain arrives in the world and the world is instantly plunging it into a tsunami of pink and blue. And I think we have not been aware till recently of how big that influence is. If Jean is right, the differences between boys and girls aren't set in stone. They're there because their experiences have taught them different skills and mental attitudes. Can you find people on your phone and text and stuff? No, I haven't got a SIM card or any credit. Haven't you? Which means I should be able to reduce the differences between the boys and girls in Graham's class of seven-year-olds. Well, let's see if I can get some boys to do pictures just the girls at the moment. Research at Stanford University has said that seven is a key age for children because it's at this point that they are beginning to have fixed ideas about the differences between a man and a woman. Excellent. Amber, would you like to share yours? But not so fixed that they can't still be changed. Five and two, they'd be quite loud. Think about the patterns in the twos and the fives times tables. Riley. <laughs> So I've asked Dr Stella Mavravelli from the Psychometric Lab, University College London, to run a series of tests to gather some data measuring these differences. So I am a scientist. I work with children and adults, and I help them learn a little bit more about themselves, and you'll be helping us learn a lot more about children your age. These tests will look at the differences between the boys and girls when it comes to... One is only men, two is only women, and three is both men and women, so these are jobs, OK? Their levels of self-esteem, how clever they think they are, known as perceived intelligence. We have to write a question and we have to write the answer to it. Their understanding and levels of empathy. If my mother is happy, I also feel happy. Assertiveness. And how good they are resisting impulses to act. A trait that is linked to aggression, bad behaviour and lying. You will be allowed to eat one sweet, but then you've got to leave the rest until the end of the day. No! no! Right, we need to get back on with our maths. I protected mine. Wall right in Scotland. Because the Roman could have get in there. And how much vocabulary they have to describe their emotions. Happy. Excited. Joyful. Smiley. Funny. Joyful. Um. Fun. Family. Love. Excited. Enjoyable. Uh, 
I don't know. Can't think of any. I can't think of any. Graham also scored each of the children for levels of classroom behaviour, hyperactivity and poor conduct. Thank you so much. You've done amazingly well. I'm collecting them. <laughs> Stella has sent me the results of the week of tests and um, they are shocking. I'm seeing here uh, evidence that the girls significantly underestimate how clever they are and have less self-esteem and self-confidence. And the boys can't seem to express their emotions except anger, which is really disturbing. And the girls seem to uh, use words such as um, ugly, lipstick, pretty, so all, everything to do with looks to describe themselves. I'm disappointed by these results. Gina has told me that boys' and girls' brains are the same, so there's absolutely no biological reason why the results should be like this. What is really worrying is that Lane's End is a school like any other in the country. So if these results are true for them, then they're probably true for every other class in every other school. So I'm heading back to the Isle of Wight, where for the next five weeks, I'm going to stage a number of classroom interventions. When you think about love, what does it remind you of? Maisie, what does it remind you of, love? These are designed to tackle the differences I've seen in the boys and girls in our series of tests and change them when Dr. Stella retests the children at the end of the term. Lovely. Can you sit properly, please, Amber, love? Cara, love, what does love remind you of? And to ensure that any changes that take place are down to my interventions, we're going to use the other Year 3 class as a control group. They will be tested at the beginning and at the end, but apart from that, they'll have a term of normal lessons. Girl, be summer, and boy, be sunny. I'll teach you all how to be Jedi. But before I do anything, I want to talk to Graham to find out if what he knows about the children ties up with what I've found. So this is a really interesting thing, I think. There's something called perceived intelligence. Right. OK, so there was a little test, and the object was to ask them what score they thought they would get in That's this right, test. Yeah. And overall, many, many more girls underestimated what they would achieve right, okay. in boys. And actually, three times as many boys overestimated what they would achieve wow. when compared to the girls. Yeah. Girls underestimate their ability and boys overestimate. And in fact, one of the girls, Lexi there, mm -hmm. estimates she only gets three out of 10, but actually yeah. scored nine out of 10. Wow. Ditto for Grace and Tiffany there. I definitely think that's something that we, we do see within class, that the boys actually have this greater belief in their own abilities. And uh, well, the girls seem to be a bit more quieter about it all. And t uh, Tiffany, Grace and Lexi, I can see they're, they're girls actually that are, are quite low on confidence. Grace came to us from a different school and she was really low on confidence, especially when it came to things like maths. The most telling for me personally was the emotional vocab. So we gave them a word mm -hmm. and we asked them to give a number of words associated to them. Right, OK. And, and across all of these emotions yeah. are one the girls scored more than wow. the boys. And the only one they didn't score more in was the angry. Wow. So boys had more words to describe angry than yeah. girls. But already at this point, something's happened somewhere that girls can express their emotions yeah, much more. And do you see like that this. in class? Uh, yeah, we do, actually. It's harder for the boys to express their feelings. You can ask, and they, they get angry sometimes, and you can say to them, why is it you are angry? And they're not like, just I'm just damn angry. It wasn't just differences in intelligence or emotion that were revealed in our testing. For self-esteem, 50% of the boys described themselves as the best, but only 10% of the girls, with one girl describing herself as ugly. Girls also had low scores for self-confidence, while boys struggled with empathy. It was a shock looking at some of the data and the assessment that came back. There are some quite big challenges there for the children, especially the girls that underestimated their own ability. And also, there's some quite biased views about what boys are expected to do and what girls are expected to do. And I'd really like to change that. That's the only thing I'm really nervous about. That actually, we do this and nothing happens because I really want there to be a difference. <laughs> Quick, just shut your coat in. 
The first thing I want to do is address the differences that the children told me about themselves. Some might. Wherever they look, I want them to be faced with things that highlight their similarities and not their difference. Knock, knock. Sandre. Hello, Javin. How are you all? Yeah. Hey. Do you know what we're up to? Right. What we're going to do is we're going to try and change the classroom. We're going to ensure that the boys and girls are treated equally because you can all do as well as each other. So here we've got some boards which you're all going to help put up. It says that boys are strong. Yay! But so are girls. Yay! Girls are strong. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start putting some stuff up then. Yeah, you could put it on the table. It doesn't have to stay there forever. It could change every week. So where's the best place to put this sign so that people see it? These signs have been written to challenge what the children themselves have told me about how they view boys and girls. Where do you think it would have the best impact? What's yours say? Girls are clever. Is that, do you agree? Girls are clever? Yes. Yeah. How about this one goes here? I don't think that's a good idea. Who had this one? Finley. Finley. Yeah. Good job. Yes. Yeah. That's good. It looks like it's just a few words on the walls, but it's about more than that. It's about the language, the climate, the environment in which the children find themselves. Um, they're now receiving lots and lots and lots of small messages together, the sum of which is far greater than their parts, and it's telling them boys and girls are equal. They're in there for many hours a day, most of the days a week, so it's a big thing. The biggest influence in the classroom is Graham. I was saying you, Jay. You two guys. I want to find out from head teacher Mrs. Sice how she thinks he does at treating the children the same. Mr. Andre is a great teacher, but his biggest strength is his relationship with the children. Uh, he knows those children really well. However, when we were doing observations, when he was asking questions and gathering answers, often would ask more boys than girls. Why do you think, fellas? And this is what we had picked up in observations with him. So, yeah, really important to, to see if we could change Mr Andre and, and ensure that his children were getting an equal sort of experience in his classroom. I've got an idea that I think will do just that. What do you think this might be? What does it say on there? Grace. Oh. What does it say on there? Maisie. <laughs> Orion. One of the most telling findings in the testing was the girls' low levels of academic self-confidence. It's got your names on it. Which is partly expressed in the confidence that they have to speak up in class. We know that you might be skewed toward letting one of the kids answer a question if they're noisy or loud. So this is a way of making it entirely fair mm -hmm. and straight down to chance. Brilliant. So Randomized. if I pull one out and say, Riley, do you think this is a good idea? Yeah. You, you think it's a good idea? Yeah, it landed on me. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> a, of course it's a good idea. <laughs> and we are going out actually now for a bit of an early break. Lily, pull them up. Anthony, what's up, mate? There's little point in doing all I can to even out differences when every time Graham opens his mouth, he uses names that massively reinforce the idea that boys and girls are different. Have you ever noticed that Mr Andre calls you boys mate or fella? He's yeah, call, mate. He calls me mate sometimes. Does he? But you're not a man. Ooh, yeah. so he's mate only for men? Yes. No. OK, what about this? What if Mr Andre called you all sweet pea? No, 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 Why not? No way. Sweet pea is the name for girls. Oh, no way. From those reactions, it's clear that this kind of language has power. So I want to challenge Graham on his use of love and mate. We counted through one of your morning sessions. But the number of times you called the girls love, love. my yeah. lovely darling or yeah. sweet pea. Yeah. And it was 104 really? times. Really? Oh, yeah. And, and the boys, you called yeah. the boys mate, lad, fella or sir. Right. And that was 47. OK. And do you know what? I'm so... I'm really aware that I do this. It's also the fact that you do tend to endear yourself to the girls twice as much as the boys. Right. Crumbs, that's a lot, isn't it? It's, it's sort of ingrained, it's something I do. So I find it really hard not to do it. <laughs> it's all too easy to laugh this off as not really mattering. But constant reminders of difference sink in and have a lasting effect on the children. I've got an idea for a way the children themselves can help Graham change his ways. It's a face. 
What do you think it might be? <laughs> Here we go. So... <laughs> we've noticed that Mr Andre likes to call some of you love <laughs> and sweet pea and some of you mate and fella. We're going to put this up and every time you hear him say love or mate or sweet pea or fella or my darling, you can put a sad face next to whichever one that he's said. <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah, I like it! Well, you've got to be honest with this. You have to be honest. If I stand any chance of affecting change, then everything that marks the children apart as different, based solely on being a boy or a girl, needs to be gotten rid of. And nothing will do that more than pet names like love and mate. So, yeah, you've seen the small things that we've put up all around the room and how we're going to change the words we use. So, a small beginning, but this is your new classroom. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> this is just a beginning, Ronnie. What? I oh, know. <laughs> it's been an interesting day today with Javid coming in. I'm a little bit worried about the board at the back of the classroom. I think because the kids are part of that too, they're going to keep an eye on me and help me to, to, to do that. And I know it's for the greater good. I know it's a, it's, it will have an impact on the children. Would you like dinners, Louis? Go get yourself a form. Of... Yes. Thank you, Riley. Oh. I look forward to seeing him. It's a new day at Lane's End Primary School. Look, Mr. Andre and she calls Mr. Andre And already, Graham is struggling with the pet names. How long did it take you to say love? It was about two minutes, Lily, wasn't it, this morning? Yeah. It was a real accident as well. <laughs> Lexi, you all right there, love? You said love. You just called Lexi love. Lexi. It's, it's much harder than I thought it was to be. Although, to be fair, I do honestly think Two's not too bad. I would have, by now, looking at 23 children, I would have called each one of them a term of endearment, I think, at least once this morning. So two's not too bad, but it's still not great. It's really, really, really hard. I really have to think about what I'm doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to queue up for assembly. I'm going to pick a ball out, and this person will be the line leader. We could have a different person each day, couldn't we? Right, Bella. Yeah! There you go, Bella. It's an encouraging first step to see the children and Graham being challenged by the changes I've made in the classroom. But next, I want to tackle one of the questions that all children have an answer for. When I grow up, I want to be a Formula One driver. When I grow up, I want to be a pop star because I like music. I'd like to be a RAF pilot and um, to be a teacher. As part of our testing, the children were given a long list of jobs. These range from ones that are traditionally thought of as either female or male, like babysitter and plumber, to less obvious ones like baker or dentist. We then asked which jobs a woman would do. I think a hairdresser, a babysitter and a nail designer. And which would a man do? Football players, tennis people, um, tennis people, a captain or a ship. What was shocking was just how certain they were that these jobs were only for men or women. And I think a hairdresser is a girl job because it's a girl job. I think a firefighter is for a boy because they need to hold up big ladders and what are really heavy. Boys are, can only be police officers because they're faster so they can catch the robbers. If you thought of a nurse being a boy, it kind of it sounds a bit weird and it would kind of look a bit weird as well. On one level, this sounds like harmless kids talk, but at just seven years old, there is no doubt in their minds. Some jobs men do and some women do. And that is limiting. Right, year threes, would you like to stand up? I want to try and show them that it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Here we go, I'm going to show you this. And on this are four jobs. Over here there's a ballet dancer, a magician, a makeup artist and a mechanic. And what I want you kids to do is to get as creative as possible Draw in their body, draw in their arms. Imagine what tools they might need. Imagine what colour hair they've got, what clothes they'd wear. But I also want you to do one thing which is really important. I want you to give them a name. Ready? Yeah! 
<laughs> I'm doing a magician. I need a penis. You want to make them naked? You can do that. How many mechanics do you know that work naked? Trillions. Oh, OK. The jobs I've chosen aren't really the important part. I'm not trying to turn all the girls into wannabe magicians. But what I do want to do is to explore the kind of rigid thinking they showed in our testing. So you're thinking about who might do this job, yes? A girl. A girl, OK. I'd put them in then normal jobs, like their makeup after would normally be a girl and a car mechanic would normally be a boy. Your magician is a mister, I see you've written here. He's going to be mister and then bubbles. OK. My car mechanic, I might call him Diamond Steve, I'm not sure. This is Hayley, she's a ballerina because most ballet dancers are a lady. My makeup artist is a woman, she's gonna have a mirror and lipstick because it's makeup and lipstick's makeup and usually have mirrors for her makeup. Yeah, it's basically a woman because it's usually a woman. And the ballet dancer is called Anne because lots and lots and lots of ballet dancers are girls. It's surprising how fixed the children's ideas are. Almost without exception, the mechanics and magicians are men and the makeup artists and dancers women. But there is absolutely no reason why that should be. So I want to show them an alternative. Are we ready? Come in. Come in, come in. <laughs> Look what your hands to your mouths, huh? So you were drawing four people earlier, weren't you? Yeah. Are they the people on my sheet? Why don't you introduce yourselves and we'll find out. Hello, so my name's Rob and I'm a makeup artist. <laughs> I'm Andrea and I'm a car mechanic. Hello, my name is Dane and I'm a dancer. Hello, I'm Karina and I'm a magician. Yes. <laughs> is that surprising, Riley? <laughs> come forward and meet them all properly. Come on. Oh, yeah. Come on, say hello. <laughs> right, you five ladies, would you like to come with me? Yes. Everybody stand back then. I am a magician. Whoa! <laughs> is that fun? So my name's Rob, and I work on films like Star Wars and Avengers. Wars. Yeah. yeah. Meeting role models can be hugely influential. Turn. Like this or something. Missy, and go. Very good, very good. Because what we learn from them is more likely to change our behaviours and beliefs. What um, is that? It's part of the exhaust, and what it does is it collects all the nasty soot. Is it really, really hot? It gets incredibly hot. Have you guys ever met a female mechanic? Yes. Uh, yes. No. Where have you met one? Uh, ah. met me. So, Lexi, have you enjoyed meeting the mechanic? Yeah. I think that it's really cool that it's a girl mechanic. So yeah. sometimes we might have to paint on a little black eye because someone in the, in the film might happen that they get punched in the face or something. Yeah, like Thor's brother Loki when they all right, have to Loki, fight yeah. him. Do you think that the makeup artist is cool? Yeah. yeah. I like it. Can a boy get the chance to be makeup artist, not always a girl? Oof, looks sore, doesn't it? It was tickling, wasn't it? And turn left, and drop to the floor, and fall down, and up, and turn, and finish. Very good, very good. <laughs> Who's been the coolest person you've met? Ah, it's got to be the dancer, because I don't know why, I just like it. I think that everyone jobs, because everyone can have a, dance, a chance to do what they like. This was not a hard thing to do, to get some people in a room and show the children that there's an alternative to what they think as the inevitable path for men and women. By making them face their own assumptions, we've made a lasting change. Boom, high five, double, yeah. It would be easy for schools to do something like this, but they aren't. And that means another generation of children growing up with fixed and limiting ideas about what they can achieve. So what do we need to say to all these wonderful people to come to see us this afternoon? I do apologise for some of your children. What's happened to them this afternoon, I don't know. But I mean, they have lots of things that they can tell you about today. It's been amazing today. Did you have fun? Yeah. Let's have a look. And it's really real! <laughs> Painting! A lazy magician! A 
lazy car mechanic, a male dancer, and a male makeup makeup artist, which done this. Oh, mm. I'm really surprised. Yeah. I think if we did, if we did the same activity that we did earlier again tomorrow, then you'll get probably a whole different set of pictures on those bodies. I'm sure you would. I actually think this, this could be a, a step in the right direction of the change in their views. While changing the children's perceptions is a start, I think it's just one part of the problem. In our testing, the girls scored 30% lower than the boys in self-confidence in maths. Two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The ability to process and understand numbers, shapes, and how objects fit together, known as spatial awareness, is key to success in a number of traditionally male-dominated professions. According to the Office of National Statistics, less than 10% of engineers and 20% of architects are women. I want to know why it is that men dominate when it comes to spatial awareness. People are very interested in the fact that, on average, girls tend to do worse on, on what we call spatial tasks and it seems to be very much a function of encouraging boys or boys having more experience with visuospatial skills. They've got their head stuck in a Lego instruction book, for example. So people have looked at whether or not you could improve performance by training. So these are scans of girls who had opportunity to play Tetris intensively for three months. And what they found was that their spatial skills improved and actually there were structures in the brain which changed. So it's physically changed yes, in response the, the to the Tetris training. Yes, the cortex has training. got thicker, to, to put it in simple terms. So a male child might be much more encouraged to play with games that are to do with spatial awareness. So the brain is rehearsed and practised at that, develops more, and it's actually the child becomes better at it. Yes. And we know that if you practice, makes perfect, so yes. to speak. And also, if you're better at something, you enjoy doing it more. <laughs> Gina has given me an idea of how I can brain train my class to even out these differences and build their confidence in their abilities that affect subjects like maths and science. Spatial ability is a key component in the STEM subjects, so the subjects of science, technology, engineering, and maths. And those subjects are crucial for future careers, potentially in engineering, architecture, even surgery. OK, kids. What we're trying to show today is to see if any of you are better than the others at spatial awareness, mm -hmm. being able to look at physical objects and seeing how they relate to each other. And Mr. Andre and I are going to have a quick test now. Are we? Excellent. Yeah, like yeah. Hang on, here we go. Shh. Look at those big, colourful shapes again. Right. This is a Tangram puzzle. Mr. Andre and I's task is to make this shape out of these. Right. So, should we go for the ends first? So, I thought one. Tangram puzzles use seven geometric shapes that can be arranged into various complex patterns. A green triangle that needs to go. To be good at it, you need to be able to manipulate shapes, understanding how they fit together and how they change when you flip or rotate them. <laughs> there we go. Well, that's there. a thing, isn't it? The bit's gonna go. This trains the temporal lobes of the brain that are responsible for processing shapes. Just leaves. There we go. Oh. That was good. That was easy, easy. Teamwork. Well done. Teamwork. So now you're each going to get one, and you're going to practice right now with one particular shape. OK, this is the shape I'd like you to make. You've got it in front of you. What does it remind you of? Sailboat. A sailboat. Yeah. Away you go. Oh, this looks easy. I've given the children 10 minutes to try and reproduce the shape that looks like a ship. 
If you're a boy who's been playing with Lego or Minecraft his whole life, you're much more likely to be better at this type of task and more confident in it and have confidence in those subjects like maths and physics. Done! Done! It looks like the boys have done it before. Yeah, right. so is it that they're more practised at it, more rehearsed? Right. And the point of this is to give them all an even playing field in terms of rehearsal, yeah. practice and exercising that part of the brain. Yeah. Grace, these are even... Both Grace and Tiffany scored in the bottom half of the class when tested on their self-confidence in maths. <laughs> Which point comes off? Look at that point in the shape of it. On the sheet, it doesn't look the same as the same shapes as the wooden block ones. There's a couple, actually. Uh, Tiffany's really struggles. I think, you know, 15 minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, not long out of the school day, right. could really help exercise this and get them all up. But these know, are great maths problems as well, you know. Would this fall into maths. your numeracy yeah, type absolutely, thing? Absolutely, yeah. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. There's clearly a huge gap between boys and girls, which I hope this intervention will go some way to closing. Graham's class isn't unique. It's worrying to think that the difference I've seen here could well be found in other classrooms in the country. And I don't think people are doing enough, leaving generation after generation of little girls excluded from future careers that require abilities in STEM subjects. Is this five to three? It's home time already. So Riley, Louie and Cara, off you go to Games Club. The rest of you can go home. It's easy to think that boys are just better when it comes to developing their spatial awareness skills. That girls don't like playing in that kind of way. They naturally prefer dolls to boys' toys. I want to put that to the test, because I'm pretty sure that that idea is rubbish. Toys are just toys. So I'm going to conduct an experiment, something a little unorthodox. I've gathered some babies and swapped their clothes. For the next couple of hours, Marnie becomes Oliver and Edward becomes Sophie because I want to see the kinds of behaviours and assumptions adult volunteers make when they think they're playing with a little boy or girl, even when they're not. Look at this. Look at this. Do you like a dolly? Shall we go for the dolly? There's a good girl. You're a good little girl, aren't you, Sophie? Look, what does this say? Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. <sighs> Oh, and what's this? Ooh, look at this sofa. What's startling is the assumption that because Edward is dressed as a girl, the adult thinks he wants to play with the soft toy. Meow, meow. <coughs> Not the toys that encourage understanding shapes or being physically confident. Does she think she had any favourites? Yes, I do. I think she liked that pink pink dolly the best. If I were to tell you, actually, that Sophie is Edward... Ah! Does well, that change anything? I maybe thought, oh, this is a little girl, so I have to give her little girl things. You made the choice for this infant yes, I think so. to play with that doll. Yeah. So what I'm saying is when, when adults choose the, for the children mm -hmm. how they play, what with, what yeah. role they're going to have, then they're going to end up there. Yes. One, two, three... <laughs> What do you want to play with? Do I see my robot? She's picked up the robot, the car, the puzzle game. And I think she's been much more physical in handling the child than the other adults have been with girls. So long. So long. Hello. Hello. What's this one? <gasps> What's that one do? Is that a robot? What about this one? <gasps> you like that one? What does this one do? Right, okay. Oliver. Oliver. 
never. You've gone for, you could say, boy toys for possibly, this boy. Possibly, possibly in my subconscious, but for me, I was just going for what was around me, but then perhaps my subconscious was automatically playing a trick on me. That I was if I tell you that he is actually a girl. Really? Yes. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. I suppose it's because of the stereotype. And then that changed your behaviour yes, towards it the did. child. Yes, it did. And your behaviour was lie. quite yeah, directive. So how does that make you feel? Like, you changed your behaviour. Really shocking, because, you know, children today, we're trying to teach children that you can be what you want to be, but yet we're still forcing an identity on a child. This identity, based on how we think a child should act, isn't harmless. It has much deeper and longer-lasting consequences than choosing which toy to play with. Gender differences in emotional health. So here it says, women with anxiety disorders are more likely to internalise, which results in typically loneliness, withdrawal and depression. Men, on the other hand, are more likely to externalise, which leads to aggression, impulsive behaviour, coercive and non-compliant behaviour. And there's an article. Are men natural born criminals? The prison numbers don't lie. So less than 5% of the country's prison population is female. People who research masculinity in prisons, men don't cry, men take it on the chin, you can't be soft. Simply being born a boy means you're much more likely to end up in prison, but then you're much more likely to earn more than a girl. The gender pay gap. There are less women, full stop, in the top 100 companies as bosses than there are men called John. The sum of all of these statistics, well, there's potential for that to be really quite sinister or insidious if you don't stop to think about why. These statistics have really brought it home to me that some children across the country have a difficult and uncertain adult life because of what we tell them it means to be a man or a woman. So Lex, you've got to do the vote, and you've got to choose a 100-word challenge. To be honest, I'm really proud of what I've done so far. Just to have this number is good. Graham might be feeling positive, but I'm keen, two weeks into my time at Lane's End, to hear what changes he's seeing in the children. And you think they've noticed some changes? Yeah, I do think they've, they've definitely noticed changes. They're taking it on board. They are making links between, you know, these positive signs and yeah. things that we're saying in the classroom. I think what will be interesting to see at the end, to see how much they've changed in a relatively short space of time. Has there been any resistance from one or two of them? No, not really. Not with anything that we've done yet, but... <laughs> don't know what's to come. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah, still early days. Next, I want to challenge another of the areas from our testing. What the children think about strength. I'm going to say some words. Yeah. And I want you to say if they're a boy or a girl word. Strong. Boy. Weak. Woman. <gasps> a girl. Strong. A boy word. Because they're stronger than girls. Boys. Boys. Because they run around more. Boys because they go to the gym more. I think. Strong is a boy bird because normally boys have really strong muscles. If you look at the world's strongest person, he's a boy. In the children's minds, there is no doubt. Boys are stronger, they've got bigger muscles, and girls aren't comparable in any way. As a doctor, I've got an understanding of our bodies, how we grow, how we change. And what I know is that there's actually no difference in muscle mass and strength between boys and girls right up until the age of puberty. But strength isn't just about biology. Our testing showed that the boys had limited vocabulary around expressing their emotions, that they linked being strong with not showing how they felt. Do you cry? No, but I do get angry. And what, do you do, what happens when you get angry? Uh, I try breaking my bed and I break my Lego. Do you cry? Yeah, I think girls cry more because um, because boys are stronger and they, they can hold their tears in. 
What about crying? Do you cry? No. Is it OK for boys to cry? No, because they're strong. These children have such different ideas when it comes to strength, and there really is no reason for it. I want them to understand just how similar they are in terms of physical strength, even if that forces the boys to challenge the belief that they will always come out as the strongest. So, I've built a little surprise for them on their playing fields. Let's march. Right, come around here. OK, kids, now we're going to test your strength. Yes. Okay. How hard do you need to hit to get tested? Listen. But before we get to doing that, you've got one minute now. I want you all to line yourselves up from strongest to weakest. Go. <laughs> Everyone's running to the left. <laughs> so I want to see a line. Addy says he's in the middle. I am not strong. Me too. Clara puts herself at the end. No, I'm stronger than you. How do you know? I'm stronger Look, than you. Mr Andre, they won't let me go on that. Why? Do you think you're the strongest then, Riley? Push me out. Yeah, but Move I'm over a bit. To get into my Boys, we're not fighting. They won't let me go Calm down. It's interesting there's been a bundle for who's the strongest, so um, a, a little, little scuffle for the boys. Uh, trying to put themselves in the strongest position. No compromise, but there's, there's certainly a preponderance for boys at the strongest end and girls at the weaker end. Knowing that these children are more or less equal when it comes to their biology, this isn't really about strength. Right, thank you very much for doing that. Now come back together. I believe it's about the children's self-confidence and levels of self-esteem. So I'm going to ask each one of you to tell Mr. Andre and I what you think you're actually going to score. Ronnie, what do you think you'll score? Ten. Ten. Our test showed that the girls massively underestimated what they thought they could achieve. Lily, you think you'll score? Five. OK. Tiffany, what do you think you might score? Five. But with a simple demonstration of how strong they really are, I can challenge that and hopefully improve their levels of confidence. Lexi? I think I'll score a five. What do you think you'll score, Bradley? Nine. Riley, what do you think you'll score? Ten. Okay. I'll break the bow. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Some quite high predictions there. Oh. Yes. Now, kids, thank you for doing that. One by one, you're now going to come up and test your strength. They will each have three attempts to ring the bell. What yes. happens if we miss the button? If you miss the button, that's it. You just okay. have to put zero. Yeah, absolutely, Lily. OK, Orion. Choose your weapon. Thor's hammer. <laughs> three goes each. And I coordinate to concentrate. Two. Two. Four. Go, Bella. Yes. Oh, five. Oh! <laughs> well done, That's Bella. close to a ten, wasn't it? Oh, oh, we missed it. Go on, Louis. Give it a good effort. <laughs> Go for it, Lily. Oh. 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 Lexi, have you had a go? Come on, Lexi. Lexi estimated that she would score just five out of ten. You can do it, Lexi. Crying because you're happy. Why? Why are you? Why are you happy then, Lexi? Because I didn't think I could do it at first. Yeah, and you're really happy because you did. We're really happy because you did too. Is it happy tears? That's all right then. We don't want the happy tears. <laughs> That's brilliant, Lexi. Well done, you. Excellent. Lexi, I'll get you a well done. Oh, and I'll done. send it at your house. Next up, Riley. He has predicted hitting the bell and getting a maximum score of ten. Come on, Riley. No, no. Good luck, Riley. Oh. I did that count. Yeah. I can't hit it. <laughs> oh. I can't hit it. I can't hit it. Don't worry, Riley. <laughs> I can hit it. 
When we tested the boys, 63% of them had problems dealing with their emotions, including Riley. <laughs> Why do you think that happened? <gasps> Why are you kicking the hay? <sighs> I don't want to do it anymore! But do you think you're going to get a chance if you do it again at the end? Of course you are, yes? Yeah, but it wouldn't count as a proper score. Why do you think it didn't work? No, it doesn't matter. It's all about trying, it's isn't it? Why are you so cry? upset now? Because I always get ten on them. Aren't you even happy that your friends did well? No. Why not? I always win everything. So you, you're, you're quite competitive, aren't you? So listen, when you throw yourself on the mud like that, why, what's that achieving? <clears throat> don't know. Why do you have that reaction? Because I'm angry. Riley was overconfident and, of course, he got upset in the whole class not scoring anything. He doesn't use words to describe negative emotions, and that's quite telling. Listen. Right. What do we see here? Look at Grace. She thought she'd get six, she got ten. Cara thought she'd get six, she got ten. Ronnie, Bradley, Lily, Lexi. Down here, Lexi, five. So many of you got Louis. ten. What I'm going to tell you is this. At your age, boys and girls have exactly the same strength. But we all got different size. As long tools. as... That's a good point, Cara. So, if you're the same size as another boy or girl, your muscles are exactly as strong as each other. So what do you think about that? Boys and girls are as strong as each other. But they are! Not a surprise, and good for them to see the boys having confidence in themselves and estimating they'll score highly. But with the girls, why do they underestimate themselves? Six of the girls thought they'd score six points or less. And in fact, five of them then scored ten. So they are achieving what the boys can achieve. They can, they're seeing that they can do that, but they don't have the belief in themselves in the first place. And hopefully all that we're doing is going to change that. I can't get it. I thought I was going to get a five, and I was happy crying because I got a ten. I feel really happy and proud of myself. Before I did this, I think that boys were stronger than girls because everyone just said that. But now I think that girls and boys can be strong. Seeing the girls actually coming up and achieving as good, as good, if not better, most of them were far better. But I think actually that's probably instilled in them that confidence. So actually to see that that change, and I think it is a, a real change, it, it's, it's exciting. Well done. <laughs> Lexi's done it. But today hasn't been a total success. Riley. I think you can in a minute. Yeah. Do you know what? The first time you do it, and if you miss, take your time, okay? And be positive. <sighs> You can do it. Although Lexi's had a really nice breakthrough, this represents a big setback for Riley, and there are 23 children in the class. I've been here two weeks, three weeks. I'm worried that all I've done is upset a load of kids, and none of this is having the slightest effect. I've realised just how entrenched these differences are for boys and girls, and that interventions in the classroom aren't going to be enough. Next time. Did you like being a girly girl? Yeah. I take the fight home to the parents. Because it's all very pink and girly. Wow. <laughs> Challenging them. Yes, I'm afraid that has to go. And the children. <laughs> he said, look, Mum, I've got a handgun. You can't take this one off me. Before finding out <laughs> if I have succeeded... I want it to go back to boys and girls. ..with my class of gender-neutral seven-year-olds. Turn these kids into monsters. The girls. The girls, the girls. I never like it before. <laughs>